Executive Director. Oh, oh, Hayden is stuck in the mute land. I'm trying to do it. It's coming. Hold on. There you are. Hayden, you have permission, I think. It feels good. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Here we go. Welcome. Thank, thank you. Uh, welcome back, everybody. Hey, just a couple quick um, housekeeping variety of things. Uh, first of all, in 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 um, in chat conversation or in a uh, small group breakout conversations, rather, um, and also overnight, I've had some questions, uh, a couple of questions about materials from speakers. Um, and to the extent that those are available to us from our speakers, we will be getting those all out uh, to all of our registrants for the Readers Retreat. So you'll be getting that stuff. We are also, one thing that I'm, that I'm hearing again and again is how lots of us would be really eager to get some recommendations for further reading from these speakers. And so we are going to follow up with our speakers and uh, get their materials out to you uh, as it's possible, and also to get to you some, some recommendations from them for future reading uh, following up on this year's Reader's Retreat. Uh, so those two things are done. Hey, and now I am very pleased and honored to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Ayodeji Oganaika, Assistant Professor of Africana Studies at Bowdoin College. Uh, at Bowdoin, he teaches interdisciplinary courses on Africa and the African diaspora that center around the important role religion plays in these communities. His research focuses on Islam in Africa, Christianity in Africa, traditional African religions, and African diaspora religious traditions. His particular focus is on the historical and contemporary dynamics of indigenous Yoruba traditions, their development in diaspora and interactions with Islam and Christianity on both sides of the Atlantic. Professor Oganaika earned his bachelor's, master's and PhD all at Harvard University. Uh, following his college graduation, he served an apprenticeship to an Ifa priest and diviner in Nigeria before returning to Harvard for his master's and PhD. I'll note that it's perhaps no surprise that he subsequently landed in Brunswick, Maine, widely known as the Cambridge of the Androscoggin. Uh, Dr. Oganaika uh, has a current book project, How Worship Becomes Religion, which analyzes how the worship of traditional Yoruba deities originally differed greatly from Western notions of religion but eventually became the most widespread and celebrated indigenous African religion through contact with modernity and mission Christianity. He is also working on a children's book of Yoruba mythology. Today, Dr. Oganaika will be talking about Igbo philosophy of art and religion and how Achebe works inside that philosophy in the novel. And we are so happy to welcome you this afternoon, Professor Oganaika. Well, thank you for that overly generous um, introduction. Um, I'm kind of excited to meet myself now or whichever person it was that you were describing. He sounds a lot more interesting than uh, I think I am myself. Um, so I very much appreciate it. And I, uh, <coughs> excuse me, I'll try to do my best to live up to the hype. Um, I will try to share my screen now so you can all have a look at uh, this presentation. Um, and I toyed around with uh, what I might like to call it a little bit, um, but I ultimately settled on an Igbo proverb that Chinua Achebe likes to or, or liked to quote, which is no condition is permanent. Um, and mostly it's a reflection on his ambivalent and very nuanced commentary on religion and culture in Igbo land. Um, and it's really wonderful that it worked out this way that I'll be following Jago's great presentation earlier. Uh, because you'll see a lot of the exact same sort of themes uh, and that the way he deals with very difficult and thorny issues is directly based on his uh, extensive experience and mastery of Igbo art and philosophy, 
and resists a lot of the uh, very simple categories that we might try to force his work um, and opinions into. Oops. And so I thought I would actually get started with uh, a couple of these proverbs that Achebe was very fond of, um, and then quotations he has that I think uh, illuminate them a little bit more. Um, and I wanted to start that way because Achebe is known uh, very widely, obviously, as this wonderfully acclaimed author. Um, and some people also know him as a master of Igbo arts or a student of Igbo arts as well. Um, but I think his expertise expands quite farther than that. I think he was also uh, a master of the study of uh, traditional Igbo philosophy and religion. Uh, and we'll get into how that's a bit ambiguous as well later on. But the first quote, uh, which is the one I think for which he's probably best known to quote, is you do not stand in one place to watch a masquerade. And I'll show you some pictures of traditional Igbo masquerades later on, but you heard them described in the novel. And you know, they move around quite a lot. They come out and they move around the city and they dance and they interact with people. And so Achebe, in uh, talking about this quote, once said to Uli Bayer, who was a very famous scholar of uh, Yoruba and uh, broader Nigerian traditional arts. He said, you use it, um, this particular uh, proverb, when you are telling people not to get so deeply rooted in one thing that they don't see the possibility of change. The world is in a continuous state of flux, and we, as inhabitants of the world, must learn to adapt, to change, and to move. So the whole concept of mobility in Igbo culture is enshrined in that proverb. Even old customs, customs that are wonderful, may at times no longer be useful. We must be ready at any moment to try something new. That is basic to Igbo culture, the idea of change. And so you have to dance around with a masquerade. You can't just stay in one spot, or otherwise it'll pass you by and you'll miss the whole point of what's actually going on. Uh, another one from which I took the title for this uh, presentation is no condition is permanent which sounds a bit like a truism, um, but there's a lot of deeper meaning in it um, that I think is very pertinent to the novel. And explaining it, he says, art must interpret all human experience from anything against or for anything against which the door is barred can cause trouble. And I see these as inherently linked because if you view no condition as permanent, then one, you can't hold on to something that you have too tightly and bar the door to anything else that comes in because then you're afraid that what you have is actually going to change. And similarly, you don't need to resist something that's coming in too fiercely or categorically because you know it's going to be transient. Right? You know that it will change and it also might not be exactly what you think that it is. Um, and so you have to learn to dance with it. Um, and this is really central to um, Igbo philosophy, religion and arts, which we'll start to get into now. Unfortunately, uh, indigenous African religious traditions are probably the uh, least understood of religious traditions in the world and also the most misunderstood. Uh, so I wanted to start with some general information um, to help us all get a grasp on exactly what was going on. Achebe gives a good depiction of it, but doesn't explain everything in detail. Um, and so the general outlines of the uh, indigenous Igbo cosmology is that there's a supreme being either called Chukwu, which literally just means great spirit, or Chineke. Um, and some people argue that this is actually a bit more of a creation of colonial encounter with the Christian God. Um, and indeed, there are some striking similarities. I'm a bit more ambivalent about it. I think what's most likely the case is that it was perhaps the closest thing to a Christian God, and there was, of course, some interaction between them. Um, but as we'll see, everything in uh, traditional Igbo religion and society is inherently and internally very diverse and exists in multiple different forms in different places. So I think it's really an academic matter of whether or not it's drawn from Christianity or Igbo tradition, and it's most likely a bit of both. But oftentimes when Chukwu is associated with the male gender, um, Chukwu is paired with uh, the earth deity, Ani or Allah, um, and that's because Chukwu is associated with the sky and Ani, the great mother, is the earth. Right? And the earth receives fertilization from the sky in the form of rain. There's underneath the supreme being an extensive and diverse pantheon of lesser deities called Alusi. Um, and there are a number of them who all have different domains and areas, usually tied to something in the natural world. And those uh, aspects of nature or our physical environment 
aren't just understood as representations of the deity or you know, kind of uh, loosely tied or identified with them. Usually they are, which is why killing that sacred python was such a big deal. It's an attack on a deity. And also why it's so ridiculous for the missionaries to say, oh, these are all false gods, right? They're not actually real. That'd be like telling somebody like, oh, lightning isn't real. You say, well, I've seen it. Of course it exists. Um, that's a, a bit of a crazy proposition. Um, and underneath this uh, diverse pantheon of lesser deities, uh, there are ancestors uh, called Adichie, who uh, are a bit heterogeneous themselves as well. They could be a kind of collective ancestor of a whole lineage or a whole community. Um, or they could just be a sort of disembodied spirit of sorts, um, but oftentimes they can also be specific individuals, right? say the founder of a lineage or the founder of a particular village. Now, and ancestors in essence are people who have died, but that type of death doesn't operate in the same way we might think in the Western world. Their death is really just a transition to a different stage of life. Um, and their lives, as well as the lives of even the deities, are sustained by their relevance to human beings who are living on earth today. Um, and so if you have to consistently interact with say the rain, or you have to interact with deities who set down the moral foundations or the political and social organization of your society, they're always going to be relevant to what you do and you have to do rituals to interact with them. But as soon as you stop doing those rituals or if those aspects of the world that they govern um, are no longer relevant, then they fall into non-existence. So there's a very interesting way in which even the deities and especially the ancestors um, draw their sustenance from human beings and human beings also draw their sustenance from them. It might seem a bit odd to think that a deity is dependent on human beings, um, but it's not that different from say the way corporations work, uh, say Facebook. Facebook clearly can influence the way our lives work to a great degree, um, perhaps even a scary degree. Um, but they're completely powerless if people don't buy into it, if people aren't on the platform and interacting with them. Uh, then in essence, it just passes away into nothing. And ancestors and deities are uh, a bit similar to me. And so you have the supreme being, then you have lesser deities who are kind of more diverse underneath, and then there are even more ancestors underneath them. And then on an, an even more personal and individual level, everyone has uh, what's called a chi or a personal god or a guardian angel that governs that individual person's life. So you can see there are different registers that affect an increasingly large swathe of people. There are also malevolent spirits like uh, injury, loss, death, disease, um, that also have to be placated and relationships have to be managed. As I mentioned earlier, it's really ritual that mediates these positive relationships um, and affects a kind of exchange or cementing of that relationship between people here on earth using material means. Um, and what relationships you have to negotiate are determined by membership in specific communities. So if you're born into a particular lineage, you have a set of ancestors that you have to work with and you have your own individual chi. Um, and if you're a farmer, which most people were, then you have to work with the spirit of earth. Uh, Blacksmiths would have another deity that they might have to work with. And if you take a particular title, there are spirits that are associated with it. And then you have those obligations as well. And so everybody has a different individual set of ritual relationships that they need to manage depending on their position in society. And undergirding everything um, and drawn initially from Chineke or Chuku is this sacred power or force called Ike. Um, and it is what makes everything exist. Without it, nothing is real or alive. Even things that we might think of as inanimate, like a stone, um, can only exist because the Great Spirit has put EK inside of it. And so this is a general overview of how the religious cosmology works, but there are some very important differences that I want to highlight um, because religion or what we would call religion in the modern West functions completely differently in most traditional African societies. And one of the most important differences is that human beings are not in total control of life or the world, even if they might be placed at the center of it. We're not the most powerful actors. And when you're not in control of something, it means you have to exist in a positive relationship. Otherwise, those forces might uh, act on you negatively or in ways that uh, are quite difficult and painful. And that makes the worldview and the religious traditions less scientific um, and much more relational in the sense that they don't operate in a kind of mechanistic or mechanical way. 
It's not designed around concentrating power in our own hands such that we can affect change in exactly the same way at all times and in all places in the way that we would like. Um, and oftentimes this is the way um, indigenous African religious traditions were understood as, oh, human beings not being able to cope with the difficulties of the world. And so they're trying to find ways to grasp onto them and to be able to control it. Um, in many ways, I think it's the exact opposite. If you encounter somebody who has more power than you do, um, you don't try to control that person. What you try to do is create a positive relationship. So that person's power will be exercised for your own benefit. Um, and as a result, there are so many different uh, powerful spiritual forces in the cosmos that you have to negotiate all of them simultaneously. And Achebe has an, a fairly extensive body of writing about how um, indigenous arts and religion um, attempt to accomplish this. But it also means that none of them were mutually exclusive and that you might, uh, even at different points in time, need to be involved in multiple different religious traditions at the same time. Um, and every person has to do that and negotiate it in different ways. And that means that the indigenous cosmology is highly dynamic and never fixed or fully dogmatic because it could never be uh, completely absolute. My uh, ancestors are going to be different from say Jago's ancestors. And so it would be a bit absurd to assume that he would have to do the exact same rituals that I do. Um, and also my environment here in Brunswick, Maine is quite different from what I imagine it is in South London. And so we would be interacting with different forces. And if we're interacting with different forces, why on earth would we try to do it in the same way? And that means that uh, indigenous Igbo society uh, was internally and inherently pluralistic even before the arrival of missionaries. And this is another uh, broad misconception, largely based on racist stereotypes that uh, pre-colonial Africa was ancestral and unchanging and sort of frozen in time. Um, and it was sort of fixed and that the diversity came in when the outside world um, intruded upon these kind of timeless villages that were hermetically sealed. And Sarah brought our attention to that earlier as well. Finally, I'd like to um, excuse me, mention that uh, the issue of individual preference or belief or a kind of private choice is completely foreign to these types of traditions because it exists in a web of obligations. And there's a proverb that Achebe quotes in the novel as well, that if one finger brought oil, it soiled all the others. And that any one person's decision um, or course of action would affect everybody else in society. And so your own personal beliefs or ritual actions and opinions um, have very serious ramifications for everybody else. And when I say everybody else, I don't just mean the other people living around you, even your ancestors as well. If you refuse to do their rituals, that has very serious implications for them, uh, which we'll get to later. Um, so in essence, what we would call traditional Igbo religion is really inseparable from all of life. Your occupation involves working with some of these spirits. Um, the way politics operates is a negotiation with these types of spirits. Healing, the arts, everything in essence um, has what we would call religion woven into it. And of course, as uh, Achebe mentioned, flux and nuance is really at the heart. Of that. Uh, there's another great quote that comes through Uchendu, who I think is one of the primary voices of Achebe, that what is good among one people is an abomination with others. And so there's no way to really define exactly what indigenous Igbo religion is uh, because it will look different at every different point in time and depending on your perspective. You see this very well with the concept of chi as the personal God, not just because it's different for every person, but also it could potentially be translated as destiny. Remember Okonkwo kind of curses his chi for letting him um, kill someone and then have to go in exile for seven years. Um, it is a bit like destiny, um, but your chi can be propitiated and cultivated and you can negotiate with it and manipulate it in certain kinds of ways. Um, we have a very similar concept to chi in Yoruba society, which is my ethnic group in Nigeria that we call Ori. And the way I ex often explain it to my students is that I'm a, a very short person. I'm maybe five, six on a good day. Um, and so my Ori really doesn't want me to become a professional basketball player. I could try very hard if I wanted to, and I could maybe try to force the matter, but I'd be fighting an uphill battle all the way. From a traditional Yoruba, but also Igbo perspective, a better course of action is to figure out what your chi is um, and what that guardian angel or spirit might encourage you to do, right? Or might 
what type of actions or paths it might bless, and then try to guide your life to work along with them. Um, and that's a much more productive way of sort of going about it. So there's destiny, but there's also free will, and they operate in tandem in different ways in this kind of dance like a masquerade. You also have to accept the presence of all aspects of life, whether they're good, bad, or otherwise. And Achebe has wonderful writings about this in Ibo Art. Um, in particular, he references Mbari houses, which are um, they're these incredibly ornate houses that are created by artists um, during a long period of seclusion. And they include everything from society, taboos that are broken, immoral behavior, um, moral exemplars, the ancestors, deities, in essence, the whole swap, uh, oftentimes including even colonial figures like a district commissioner, um, even if they're not held up as positive figures. And so you have to give a place for everything that exists in the world, even if you don't necessarily approve of it. And there was another really great quote that I'd like to uh, read to you here. Um, and this was in reference to when Okoli, the man killed uh, one of the sacred pythons. They said, when a man blasphemes, what do we do? Do we go and stop his mouth? No, we put our fingers into our ears to stop us hearing. This is a wise action. And so the existence of a kind of erroneous or faulty way of thinking or way of living is accepted not on its merits, but just accepted in the fact that it exists. And so Igbo society rejects absolutes. And there's a sense of foreshadowing in this, I noticed in, uh, I believe it's chapter two, with the extreme weather. When Okonkwo is planting yams, at first I believe there's an incredibly dry spell. He tries to do everything in his power to keep these yams alive, but it doesn't work, they all die. And then there's overabundant rain. Um, and at first everyone thinks it's wonderful, but that also spoils the yams. You can see how too much or too little is always a problem. Um, and the Igbo love a balance somewhere in the middle, even though it's never exactly clear where. And this will come up again later on as well. Um, and so you can see why the masquerade and its dynamism and dancing made it the favorite of Achebe, and he viewed it as the Igbo art form par excellence. It included dance, singing, poetry, um, fashion with its clothing, um, but most importantly, not only did it dance and move, it forced everyone around it to move and shift their positions as well. And so he had a particular love of masquerades that comes through quite clearly in the novel. To revisit human's lack of control in the novel again, um, there's this central issue of having to exist in a relationship with powers, and Okonkwo fails miserably at that. His father, interestingly enough, seems to be on the opposite end of the spectrum uh, in that he tries to make sacrifices to get a plentiful harvest without doing much work at all. Okonkwo tends to work really hard and get uh, plentiful yams, but he's always offending the earth. And so they're kind of on opposite ends of the spectrum. And Okonkwo's father was told that, yes, it's good for him to make a sacrifice, but he also has to clear his own farm. And, and so you have to do your part, and then you have to cultivate a positive relationship with these powers outside of you. The Okbanje children, um, as Zima is one of them, um, are also propitiated. You can see that in the names that they're given. Well, please don't leave too soon. Um, the Yoruba have a very similar tradition that we call Abiku, and you also propitiate death not to take those children away. And even when they do come, or you can keep death away, you need to give them special treatment. That's why Azima is able to call her mother by her first name, which no African child would ever do. If I, I still have trouble speaking my own father's first name uh, if somebody else has it, uh, because we get spanked relatively uh, heavily if we do that type of thing. Um, Azima also was claimed by Abala, by Chielo, when she was possessed by the deity, um, despite the fact that her family didn't want to let her go. Um, it's not really up to the family. All they can do is acquiesce and then try to cultivate a relationship. Um, furthermore, the Abame clan was told that the white man who came uh, was going to break it up uh, and bring destruction. And when Uchendu heard about this, he said, uh, he was critical of the way that they responded. He didn't critique the oracle or say that they shouldn't have uh, listened to it. He said, you have a choice in how you meet your fate. And they didn't need to kill someone who hadn't said anything just because he was going to bring destruction. The way that they interacted with it would determine how they meet that fate. And so all of life is this delicate negotiation with greater forces. And I think we're learning that quite clearly now, even in our contemporary world with COVID and climate change. 
we might all love to be able to have this meeting in person. Um, but if COVID doesn't want it to happen, we don't really have that much of a say in the matter. We can try to pretend that COVID doesn't exist, um, but we tend to um, run into the same type of problems that our Kongpo relatively ran into. Um, and it's even more severe with the issue of climate change at the moment. And uh, Achebe, you know, for me, has a really fascinatingly ambiguous tie to both Christianity and Igbo tradition. Just like Jago mentioned, he was brought up in a Christian mission. Uh, his parents were one of those first generations of uh, converts to Christianity. Um, but he's always been highly critical of Christianity in Africa. Um, and he was also a staunch defender of Igbo tradition as well. I remember after he passed, unfortunately, I read a news article of someone who said, uh, questioned whether or not Achebe was actually a real Christian because of how much he loved Igbo tradition and said perhaps he shouldn't have been buried as a Christian because somebody who defended tradition and then critiqued Christianity as much as he did couldn't possibly have actually been a real Christian. And I found Obierica to actually um, manifest some of the uh, opinions of Achebe quite directly, and you can hear his voice through him, um, because he doesn't offer a full disavowal of many issues that uh, I believe Achebe found troubling about Igbo tradition and society. Um, he critiques them, but he doesn't completely withdraw from them, and he asks questions, he probes them. Um, the most prominent and recurring one is this issue of twin deaths, which is widespread all over West Africa. Twins being born were marked as something very incredible, which could either be completely destabilizing for the society or could be a great blessing. The Yoruba, uh, a long time ago, used to have a tradition quite similar to the Igbo in which twins were taken out into the bush and left. Um, but at a certain point in time, it changed and they became actually uh, a form of deity themselves. Twins are highly revered in sort of the same way that Ezima um, was in uh, the novel. Uh, Obierica also questions Okonkwo's punishment for his inadvertent crime, and he understands that bloodshed is an offense to the earth, but he really wonders if what's best for the community is exiling this man who didn't mean to do any wrong at all and had very little, if indeed, any control over it. If exiling him is really what's best for the whole community, would the community not be better if there were some other way for him to atone for it and he could remain part of the community? He also critiques the mistreatment of the Ozo title, um, which is, I believe, the first uh, of the four titles that uh, people could take in this society. Um, and he says, oh, it's too cheap. Everybody can get it in some of these other places. And so it's lost its, uh, its importance. It's lost its reverence. But at the same time, he critiques their own treatment of the Ozo title because he sees people mistapping palm trees all over the place. And he wants to be able to show them how to do it appropriately and save some of these trees. But because he's taken the title, he has more obligations and restrictions on the ways he can behave. And he thinks that needs to change. So he still gets some critiques in there. Um, and I think he also, Achebe, not through Obierica this time, but he also critiques the way that the outcasts or the Osu are treated um, and seems to understand Christianity in a bit more of a positive light in that regard. And Woye, um, as Jago mentioned, recognized or felt some truth in Christianity, mostly through hearing the hymns. Um, and I found it very interesting that he was described as um, having a parched soul, um, which reminded me of that second chapter. I thought, oh, why is it that uh, Achebe would need to tell us about this time when um, the harvest didn't really work? Why couldn't we just skip past that? There, there must have been some kind of meaning there. And uh, Moye's soul being described as parched triggered that in my mind. He said, oh, he was looking for something or he needed something that he had been deprived of for quite a long time. My guess is largely from Okonkwo, his father, but also perhaps by Igbo society, that there was something they weren't doing that they really should have. And Woye was able to find that actually in Christianity. Of course, the main way many people have approached uh, the novel is uh, just as Jago was mentioning, a conflict with colonialism and then also a conflict with Christianity, right? Um, representing it as the foreign and intruding and invasive uh, religious tradition. Um, and I think it's both much more nuanced and conciliatory, and in some ways, uh, an even more um, acerbic attack or critique of Christianity in some ways. And you get kind of both sides of it. And to see the more conciliatory side, 
there's a really wonderful passage of about a page and a half, I believe, of the meeting between Akuna, who is one of the uh, chiefs of a neighboring village, um, and his interactions with Reverend Brown, who was the first white missionary to come to the area. And Akuna demonstrates the indigenous view of non-exclusive traditions. He says, oh, you're talking about the creator God. We already know who he is. His name is Chuku. And that's the way that almost every African society responded to Western Christianity. So oh, we already know about the God that you're trying to tell us about. Um, and furthermore, he says, yeah, we have all of these uh, lesser divinities who are kind of like intermediaries for us. You know, the sky is too far for us to reach, but there are all of these things that are much closer that we can actually work with. Um, and that's no different from the way the Church of England or the Anglican Church or Church Missionary Society operates. You have a head somewhere in your headquarters, but not everybody can interact with that head. And so there are people who are sent out um, who can do the work kind of on the ground. And so if you want to get to that head, you have to work through all of the people who are more immediately available. And he thinks this is just sort of the way that life works. Um, and Reverend Brown has difficulty understanding all of it but he doesn't have a full response against it, except to say that, oh, well, these deities are false. They're not actually real. You're worshiping dumb wood and stone. And he says, well, but the Supreme Being created them and put some of his existence in them, so they can't be dumb. Um, and we're trying to reach that ultimate deity through them. And that's very much possible. Our ancestors showed us how to do it. And so they actually had a bit of a dialogue there and they were able to go back and forth. And even though neither converted the other, they had a great deal of mutual respect and understanding and they were able to coexist. Unfortunately, the ultimate negative reaction did come, but it wasn't because of a theological disagreement. As you can see, Akuna and Reverend Brown actually quite liked each other and got along very well. Um, and just like that quote talking about someone who blasphemes, you put your ear or your fingers in your ears, you don't try to stop that person. Conflict isn't actually the first idea or option. The issue was really that Christianity disrupted the fabric of life rather than integrating into it. Diversity of opinion and perspectives is actually an integral part of the traditions. So it wasn't that it was foreign or new or different. It was that it was undermining what already existed rather than becoming integrated. And that's why Reverend Brown, even though everyone thought he was a lunatic, was actually respected because he encouraged people to find ways to coexist but Reverend Smith was despised because it was under his watch that um, people were emboldened to start undermining indigenous traditions. So the communal rituals, uh, as I mentioned before, really defined group identity and were non-exclusive. So this idea of forcing people to start making a choice between Christianity and all of Igbo life seemed uh, abhorrent and very, very confusing and difficult to understand or grapple with. And furthermore, it meant if you no longer took part in those rituals, it meant you were really no longer part of the group. Um, and that was very difficult to even imagine or conceptualize, um, which is why you couldn't attack people like that because they still seem to be part of the group, but they're not behaving like part of the group. And how do you deal with that? And it all came to a head really at this attack on a masquerade, um, which of course is violent in a sense, but it's much uh, more insidious than that. An attack on a uh, masquerade is an attack on the past, on ancestors, and the moral fabric of society. If you remember the, uh, the in essence, court case when uh, a man was accused of beating his wife, the ultimate court of appeal was the ancestors, was having the masquerades come out and hear both sides and then give a final ruling and judgment. Attacking a masquerade and killing it, in essence, is cutting people off from access to the wisdom um, and the moral influence of the ancestors and undermining the very fabric and social norms of that society. And furthermore, abandoning these ancestral rituals and attacking masquerades or unmasking them, um, it means the collective death of those ancestors and furthermore, a real death for the living is if the ancestors are no longer propitiated or they're not allowed to come out and interact with us anymore. It means that those who are living cannot become ancestors and will actually die when they uh, pass on. And more importantly, the whole chain of ancestors going back to the very first who settled in that particular area pass into non-existence when they're no longer propitiated. So you can see the entire fabric of society starts to fall apart 
and even the future generations will no longer be connected to those who have gone before them um, because that linchpin has effectively been removed. And it was only at that point when the community came together and said, we simply can't tolerate this. We always create space for whatever exists, but at this point, it's not merely existing, it's destroying everything around it, it's cancerous. And even then they came and said, well, look, we have to take some kind of action. Here are the options, um, but we simply must do something. We can't just leave it anymore. It's not a matter of opinion. It's actually just a matter of fact. If action isn't taken, the whole world will sort of collapse. And this is a, a picture you can see on the screen is uh, an example of a pastor from a few years ago um, who came into open conflict with uh, a masquerade, much as happened in the book. Achebe also does a really wonderful job of making historical allusions to uh, real things that happened um, during the religious encounter between indigenous African religions and um, mission Christianity. The first and most obvious is that the earliest converts were largely marginal figures, men who would be called effeminate perhaps, um, and then especially outcasts, those who were poor or didn't have very high social standing. And the missionaries tried very hard to convert the chiefs and met with them, um, but they had very little success, mostly because the chiefs understood that their religious traditions um, and their political institutions were not separate at all. The missionaries thought, oh, well, if you'll just convert, you can use your political office to influence people to join us. But the chiefs realized that you can't really separate them um, in Igbo society. And so they had very little interest in doing that uh, because they knew it would undermine the, the fabric of their, uh, of their own lives. But for those who are already marginal, um, there really wasn't as much that was disrupted. So it was much easier. There was less of a barrier. Um, many churches were in fact a given land on what's called either the evil bush or the evil forest, um, in part because if you have to give a place in your society for a new tradition, if it seems to be a problematic tradition, right, that's causing issues for society, that's actually the most fitting place. So it's partially to get them away from you, but also because they function in largely the same way that these problematic spirits, um, those who have violated the traditional norms of society um, are supposed to be put. And so it was actually philosophically uh, a, a quite fitting decision, especially if that tradition, Christianity says that it can conquer all of the evil powers or forces in that world. So you, okay, well then go there, that's where they all are and you can do your thing in that location. Uh, there are just a few lines associated with this, but education and literacy um, were inseparable from the um, mission and its best asset. Um, Western education um, and literacy, at least in Western languages and in the Latin script, because there are lots of different traditions of literacy in Africa that predate colonialism in Arabic and indigenous um, alphabets. But uh, Western education was oftentimes called initiation into the white man's world or the white man's religion. Um, that was because education wasn't just acquiring a set of skills, it was learning a new way to be in the world, um, gaining a new set of eyes or an understanding of one's place in the world and how it worked. All of these things came along with it. Um, and as a result, that was why it was the best asset of the church and also for the colonial enterprise. And why it was so important as well as we see, um, as Jago was talking about, to have uh, curricular changes in which you no longer worked with just the same colonial um, materials um, that um, were used in essence to usher uh, a whole several generations of Africans into a largely westernized way of even understanding themselves. There are also, I, I, this was one of my favorite parts of reading the book when I was younger, is I remembered lots of Yoruba jokes about uh, differences in dialect and mistranslation of sermons and speech on the part of the missionaries. Um, and that was in large part uh, evidenced by the description of the, uh, those who were working with the colonial administration as ashy bottoms and also referring to people as buttocks uh, because the translator for the missionary spoke a different dialect um, and the words that he used meant something different. Uh, and there are all kinds of really funny stories about the ways that this um, close but slightly off uh, understanding of indigenous customs and languages made the missionaries seem very, very funny and absurd. Furthermore, conversion was never really a clean break as the missionaries wanted because again, indigenous Igbo religion um, was not really possible or wasn't possible to separate that from the rest of life. And so if you say, well, we want you to 
um, come to church and start praying and get baptized. Um, for most people who had been brought up in the indigenous world, that wouldn't mean that I can't still propitiate my ancestors and pour out libations, or I can't still make some ritual sacrifices, or I can't dance with the masquerades. And so the missionaries were constantly frustrated by the fact that they had to try to pull their uh, parishioners away from um, habits and ways of life that were deeply ingrained in them. And you see that in the novel as well. Um, finally, the antagonism towards indigenous traditions was curiously often more virulent among the uh, converts than it was even among some of the Western clergy. Um, and you see that even today, actually, that um, while there is a certain amount of prejudice um, and discrimination against indigenous African religions, um, and it originated mostly in this colonial encounter and with the advent of uh, the kind of Western gaze, it's much stronger actually in, um, on the part of a lot of African Christians than it is um, on the part of outsiders. Um, and it all began really around this same time period that Echebe was uh, describing. So in conclusion, to round it all up, I think Achebe takes a kind of masquerade approach to Christianity and Igbo traditions that isn't entirely one thing or the other, and it sort of dances around them. It accepts Christianity for what it has to offer, but is still highly cri critical, and uh, critical of its problematic introduction. And it does the same with Igbo tradition. It doesn't adopt any one approach, and it doesn't suggest that the approach that he takes is absolute and covers all angles necessarily. Um, he decides to play with them and dance with them and move around and look at it from every angle, every side. Um, Christianity, even though he is critical of the way it was introduced, he kind of accepts it as a force that must be negotiated. And that things were falling apart, mostly just because negotiation became impossible um, for some of the Christians and then also for Okonkwo, which is why I said in our first session that I view Okonkwo and um, the missionaries actually as two sides of the same coin. They were, uh, if you'll excuse the metaphor, in essence, playing the same sport on the same field, they were just on opposing sides, which actually makes them much more similar to each other um, than they were to everybody else in the story, say Obierica or uh, Uchendu, for example. So the problem um, in the novel, at least in my reading, is not change in cultural or religious contact because this had been going on for centuries for as long as anybody could remember. Rather, it was a new manner of change and the nature of that contact, which uh, Achebe seems to be highly critical of and views that particular way of approaching difference um, and change in contact um, as what's problematic and makes the fabric of society start to unravel. Um, Achebe, I think, offers us a different take on religion by refusing to play by the rules set by the West, which I think are represented by the way the, um, the missionaries tend to approach their religious differences with the Igbo. Uh, I hear from my students all the time, they're surprised when I teach them about African traditions that they thought, oh, well, if one group has deeply held religious beliefs and another group has another set of deeply held religious beliefs, that don't line up with each other, it means there's no way to really reconcile them logically or rationally. And the only recourse that's left is in essence violence. And that's why you know, religion is at the heart of um, most of the wars that humanity has fought. And apart from that last part about being at the root of all wars, uh, despite the fact that that's in essence just a myth, um, that's really just drawn from a very particular Western history, largely drawn out of what are usually called the wars of religion or the 30 years war um, and the origins of secularism in the West. But in indigenous African traditions, uh, that's not at all the way that it's approached. In fact, it's almost assumed that everybody has very different deeply held religious beliefs. And that might actually be a good thing. Um, and it certainly doesn't need to be a source of conflict in fact, those differing relationships that bind people who are different is actually the best way to ensure social harmony. So you need the difference and you need relationship between all kinds of different powers to hold everything together rather than viewing them as mutually exclusive and necessarily opposing and conflicting. And so in my reading, the novel is very much like a masquerade in that it encourages us as well to join in a dance with Echebe, to stop being rigid and to get up and move into different perspectives and allow it to help us see the issue from a bunch of different sides. Um, and then to be able to make something or take something new away from it. And then it will be different every time we do it and for each person. Um, and so this picture I have over here on the left, 
um, which might be a bit curious uh, at first glance, it's actually an Igbo pastor or priest who's praying over some traditional masquerades before they go out and dance in the marketplace. Uh, and when I first saw this, uh, I got it from somebody on Nigerian Twitter uh, who thought it was hilarious and absurd because there's this juxtaposition of these two different religious traditions that don't really, or in his mind, shouldn't have had anything to do with each other. But I thought it was actually quite uh, representative of what Achebe was trying to accomplish in the novel, that without being fully enmeshed in each other's traditions, they could still try to find ways to cultivate positive relationships. Um, it's only when they decide that they can no longer do that or that they have to fight each other that things begin to start to fall apart. And so I think I'll stop there because um, I think I should be getting relatively close to time. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Um, in a second, I'm going to bring bring Jago back, but uh, I want to I want to just ask the first question, if I can. And I've lost you on my screen, uh, but may, oh, there you are, perfect. Um, the the way you talk about that Igbo tradition of existing in relationship with powers interconnectedness. Uh, accepting other ways of thinking and being um, is, is like the opposite of a missionary mindset, almost, right? Um, and just feels like beautiful and a great recipe for resilience and uh, existence over a long time. But also in the short term, uh, faced with that missionary mindset, especially with a great deal of power behind it, force behind it, uh, at least in the short term, that that Igbo tradition kind of doesn't doesn't stand a chance uh, when they when that conflict happens. I, I mean, I think of the uh, a couple of lines down in that Yeats poem from the 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 title is drawn from where it, he the line about the ceremony of innocence is drowned. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know what how to understand that. Yeah, that's a, a wonderful question. I think that's part of the reason why we're given a conquo as the kind of foil for the, the missionaries. And right? he's kind of the opposite side of that coin, that same approach, but from the indigenous perspective. And that there might be a kind of initial desire to just resist it completely outright and say, this is against everything that we stand for and we have to stop it at all costs. But in essence, that's. Um, that's the only way that it actually wins, right? because then you're accepting its rules and playing that game. Right? The Ipo tradition, I think, ultimately uh, is much more resilient than even the missionary approach, because the missionary approach just breeds conflict and chaos. And the only order that's left at the end of that, kind of like burning a brush fire, um, is the uh, approach of finding a way to actually relate to it. And someone like Achebe, I think, lives it out quite well um, in the way that I don't want to say too much about his personal confessional identity because I, I can't say that for sure myself, not uh, being a part of his family. But he was Christian, um, or at least he was brought up Christian. Um, and he did seem to deeply appreciate Christianity. Um, and he brought some of it into himself and was able to operate in that world, um, but always remained focused on this kind of more indigenous approach. Uh, it's oftentimes in the minority, um, but I think that's really the only other path that's, or the only other option that's left. Uh, and sooner or later, I think people tend to get quite tired of fighting. Even if you think you're right, at a certain point, usually you just, you've had enough. And even Okonkwo had enough. And he, he said, there's only so far you can go with that type of mentality. So it might have more force behind it, um, but I think it's more like, uh, a supernova that just kind of explodes in on itself um, after a while. Um, but something that has a slower burn, while it might not um, rise to the surface, uh, actually has a lot more staying power to it. And I've seen that all over Africa, not just in Igbo society and Yoruba society as well. Um, you find it, I think, quite fascinatingly in the African diaspora, um, where in the face of colonialism and some of the worst horrors that human beings have ever seen, this type of philosophy still survived um, and it's gaining lots of converts all around the world even now. Uh, 
So it might not have the kind of military and political power and even the kind of ideological force and rigid, easily understandable um, boundaries, um, but it's subtle. Uh, and I think that subtlety actually is one of its strongest assets um, in its strength, or sorry, in its weakness is its strength. Thank you, Jago. I want to, to call you back up on our virtual stage here. Welcome. Hi. Hi. Great to be back. It's good to have you. Hey, I'm just um, as, sort of as Samad did yesterday. I'm going to to step to the background here and and hope that that you too can be in conversation. And I just want to invite you, maybe Jago, to um, if you had any thoughts or questions arising straight out of uh, Deji's talk if you want to kick us off. Yeah, I do have a lot of questions and thoughts. Um, just coming off your last point, it, do you think that it's possible, it just, it just comes to my mind, do you think therefore it's possible to read the novel as actually, the end of the novel as actually depicting the survival of the people rather than them coming apart because they've successfully accommodated. They may have accepted Christianity, but they're not doing away with most of their traditional practices. It strikes me there's a possible reading of that actually things aren't falling apart <laughs> except for a conquo. What do you think? Um, yeah, it's a great question. I um, I think in a very kind of ambiguous way, Achebe kind of seems to leave it up to the reader, I think. Uh, is it, you're presented with those two approaches and I think Achebe strongly suggests that neither one of those really works, uh, that neither of them should be terribly attractive to us. And so what's that third way? Like what is the kind of middle ground? Um, and it's always going to be in flux. And I don't think he quite gives an answer, but I think you're right that he's very suggestive that the way that it should be done is to, uh, to find a way to keep the traditions alive in the face of this uh, very foreign um, and in some ways very aggressive and hostile um, way of approaching things. Uh, I don't think we hear too much about you know, the way everybody else necessarily approaches it. So I think it's left to the reader intentionally, uh, but that's just me trying to channel it. But you might actually be able to answer that a bit better than I would. Because well, I was just thinking that, you know, that um, interview that I showed a bit of yesterday, with um, Wolosinka. At that point in the mid 60s, Achebe is saying, oh, it was the society was over masculine. That's why this society failed in the end. Mm -hmm. And all of the, the stuff he was saying then encouraged people to read it, the novel in a particular way, as sort of how despicable colonialism destroyed this, this, this noble society, this sophisticated society. But actually, the more I've read it, and the more I've read it in the light of his later work, which is more and more appreciative of Igbo tradition, um, the more I think he kind of got it wrong, maybe, <laughs> that he, he was misinterpreting his own work then. Or perhaps, perhaps, perhaps willfully, I don't know. Um, you're, certainly, you're certainly channeled in, in his writings and speeches and so on of the 60s, you're channeled towards viewing it in a very, the, the novel in a very kind of colonialism versus resistance type of format. And actually the novel is much more subtle than that, I think, just like you're saying, yeah. Yeah, I do think it's much more subtle than that. And I think part of the problem would be, it all depends on how you would define Igbo tradition. Right? If you work with the kind of Western binary categories of um, African and European, right, or indigenous and colonial, then Yes, things have absolutely fallen apart because the kind of Western hegemony in some ways has actually come to stay. Almost everybody is exposed to Western education and you know, there's the Nigerian federal government with all of its problems and issues and all of those things are certainly very present and uh, serious issues that everybody just has to contend with. Um, but I think maybe what you're suggesting as well is the another way of looking at it is the Igbo way of approaching things, right? which mm may not necessarily be only tied to say the you know, certain rituals or patterns of dress or you know, whatever the case may be. Because traditional Igbo society and even religion um, has always implied a certain amount of change. And again, accepting some aspects of uh, colonialism, not accepting them as correct, but just accepting the fact that they are present and part of society. Uh, 
is actually the way that things have always been done. Um, this is a bit of a different case now because it's, the stakes are higher and it's a bit more dangerous, um, but I'm not sure what else you can actually do. Um, things fall apart when you decide to be a conquo. I think that's really the, uh, the message at least that I <laughs> yeah. We could talk a little bit about um, the way he increasingly, especially after things fall apart, starts to attempt to understand the colonial mindset better as well and to humanize the colonial mindset but i just before we do that i had a couple of questions about religion do you think here's one do you think his representation of traditional worship practices um is accurate or authentic for example we both read if you have a madume and she criticizes his portrayal as quite a masculinist interpretation, maybe even a Christianized interpretation, for example, um, sort of misinterpreting the higher deity in sort of in the image of a Christian God, which is something you touched on. But how, how far do you think his, from your researches, is his portrayal accurate? Yeah, I think, and I believe Sarah might be the one who mentioned this um, earlier on, is that because we're gaining insight into Igbo society through Okonkwo's eyes, not just through his actions, um, but also the way he interprets them, it kind of actually gives us two veils of hyper-masculinity, right? Because everything Okonkwo does is very masculine in nature, and he tends not to have much respect for the earth, right? which is why mm. he, at least at three or four different points in time, um, he violates its norms, which are a huge no-no, I mean, almost no good uh, practitioner of Igbo religion would want to do that. They would be very deliberate about avoiding all of those things. But we don't hear too much about that side um, of it because that's just the way that Okonkwo operates. Even when he does have to uh, atone for the sin of beating his wife, for example, uh, he's reluctant to do it. He doesn't reflect at all on why it's supposed to happen or what he's supposed to learn from it. Um, and so I do think he sort of misrepresents uh, traditional Igbo religion to a certain extent, but I think he, I don't know if he does it deliberately, but I think it may work in some ways because Okonkwo is supposed to be a bad lens. Um, he's sort of intended to work in that way. Um, with respect- I think you're, best, you're right to say that he didn't have the benefit of lots of scholarship that we have the benefit of. I mean, most of the things written before them were written by missionaries and colonialists. Yeah. So, and, and he, he, he grew up somewhat aloof from traditional culture as well. So although he did researches, obviously, yeah. um, his understanding probably developed as he, as he grew, as he, as he aged. Yeah, I think if I remember correctly, I've read several interviews where he's, he talked about having the benefit of having an uncle who was still um, very much involved in these traditions and having some exposure from him. And, right gaining bits and pieces. And I, I have family members and my advisor in graduate school had a sort of similar experience growing up. His father was a missionary and he grew up in the vicarage and you know, lived his whole life in there. But it was very difficult to be fully separated at that time um, in kind of mid-colonial era, um, mm. all around. Uh, and it'd be very difficult to be fully separated. Um, but I do think that one, um, one aspect I noticed, and this may just be because he had a fascination with masquerades, um, he does pay quite a lot of attention to them, um, to not necessarily the exclusion, but perhaps the detriment of you know, the whole other pantheon of deities and spirits, which we don't really hear a whole lot about them. Uh, I remember the mm -hmm. first time I read it, I thought, oh, this is great. I'd love to hear more about the Oracle um, in the cave. Um, but you never really get that much. Um, yeah. If any of you have ever seen a Nollywood movie, um, like Nigeria's famous industry of movies, uh, those types of spirits and people who work with them are always right at the center of everything. Um, and so I think you're right to point to some lacuna he may have in um, his understanding of Igbo tradition. But, um, but yeah, it's hard for me to tell how much of that is just his own background um, and how much of it was an intentional choice with Okonkwo. So can I continue on questions? I've got loads. Um, I know you've written on Yoruba um, religion, the formation of Yoruba religion, that, that, that worship practices, in, as I understand your work, um, and if I look into my crystal ball and I imagine what your forthcoming book is going to be about, I suspect that it will partly talk about the way worship practices um, uh, formed into a religion, partly under the influence of colonialism. 
is in the 19th century. And you refer to Igbo belief systems or faith practices as a religion. It, is it a religion in that sense? And is there a similar process going on as far as you know? Um, did, does, does, do the Igbo become a people with a religion partly in response to foreign incursion? Yeah, there's a, a really great book. If any of you are familiar with that famous quote from Voltaire about the Holy Roman Empire being neither holy nor Roman nor an empire. Um, I think the same is true of practically any indigenous African religion, whether it's Igbo, Yoruba, um, Luo, or you know whatever the case may be. Because um, even these ethnic groups or identities were largely a product of colonialism. So the Igbo, um, while there were a lot of cultural similarities between them, and they would have understood themselves as linked, um, if you were to travel in time you know, 200, 300 years back and try to speak even the Igbo language, um, people might, might not fully understand what you're talking about. Yeah. And the, uh, the colonial encounter with you know, the rise of nationalism uh, in Europe at the time uh, focused on ethnicities and ethnic groups, and they kind of coalesced as a result of that type of contact. Uh, as I mentioned before, the issue of religion um, in most African languages, there isn't even a, a very good uh, translation for the word religion because it's such a modern and Western idea. Um, and traditional as well implies this kind of timeless, it's been happening since the age of the ancestors, um, which as well is a kind of problematic Western framework for looking at it. And they've been in flux from the very beginning. Um, and so that's a long-winded way of saying, yes, I don't think there was necessarily a traditional Igbo religion. Um, but I think to a certain extent now there has been because of contact with Christianity and a kind of need to articulate it in that way, um, in part because of governmental structures. Um, and then also just the way that you would interact with Christians in a church and a clergy and that type of thing. The way people kind of expect their religious lives to be organized. Uh, I'm not as much of an expert on Igbo traditions. Um, I don't mm. think it's quite as uh, stark as it is with the Yoruba. The Yoruba have a very well-known indigenous religion at this point. Um, and I don't think that's quite as much the case amongst the Igbo, um, but uh, I think the dynamics are relatively similar. So you've got these two sort of categories that you can apply to the novel, that you can think of it as an Igbo novel, as we both are, and it exemplifies all sorts of uh, values and practices um, about dialogue and so forth. And then you can also think about it as a Nigerian novel, as was not very often done, also often thoughtlessly, in that because it narrates the um, subordination, I suppose, of this people to a kind of colonial apparatus, we know that that all in different kinds of ways that same process was going on throughout lots of different region, areas in this region up into the islamic north and so forth and what we're seeing with the district commissioner and so on is actually the formation of nigeria mm -hmm. so although the people have no idea that this is going on you're also seeing in the background you're also sort of seeing nation building so there's a kind of there's a whole lot of sort of political layers that are quite quite interesting and he sort of unpicks that quite a lot yeah. right do i have any others about religion um yeah uh ooh. um let me see. oh just one more do you think that i mean christianity's a hybrid in my opinion and for example it incorporated the um uh the uh, the yule festival and, and all sorts of other things, and um, in a way, is a product of a process of hybridization of Judaism anyway. Do you think that Christianity hybridized in response to its encounter with the Igbo? And do you think that you see that at all in the Chebe? I think you might see it a bit, or you see seeds of it in Things Fall Apart. I think in his later writings, you see a bit more of it. Um, but certainly with respect to the Igbo, I think it's happened perhaps a bit more than it um, has in other areas. Um, and it all centers around this uh, question, which is difficult to determine even in a Western context where we have a clearly defined notion of religion, at least in theory. Um, what's the division between culture and religion? 
necessarily. Um, even in so like a post-Christian society, Christmas is still a holiday, right? And people celebrate Easter and you know, people get, they wear crucifixes or have a tattoo of a cross or have the name Christian or you know, whatever the case may be. Um, and even our ideas of human rights are very firmly rooted in um, Christian theology and the scientific method and all kinds of other things. So where do you draw that boundary? Um, and if you were to go to a lot of Igbo churches, um, if you're used to a, a kind of more tame Anglicanism or the way the Catholic Church might operate in Western Europe, uh, you might be shocked at what you see and what you hear and what you um, experience happening there. Um, so I think it has very much changed and I think that's really inevitable. Um, and you're right to mention that about Christianity. If you look at say the book of Acts, um, see there's a whole internal debate amongst the Jews and the Gentiles and Paul has to, uh, um, kind of manage that whole debate about, okay, well, what aspects of Judaism do we need to take and what can we accept from these other foreign cultures? Um, and so I think it is built into Christianity, um, but it doesn't fit terribly well with colonialism, which is why sometimes it's a, a funny concept to, uh, to think about in this particular historical context. Mm. I understand that my understanding of the missionaries is that they're really part of a global movement, some from the States, to a kind of evangelical movement to um, to uh, convert people on very particular terms. But I doubt if things played out that way. <laughs> because um, part of Christianity's success has been its ability to adapt, hasn't it? Right, sorry, I'm a bit out of religion. Um, do you have any questions for me? Yeah. I, oh, sorry, Hayden. I don't want to uh, interrupt. No, that's that's perfect. I was about to head in the same direction. That, oh, uh, yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Oh, great. Uh, well, I was uh, especially following our conversation um, in the first session. Uh, I, uh, I was curious uh, to hear if you had any thoughts about um, why Achebe chose to focus on this particular type of uh, hyper masculinity um, at this particular moment in time. Um, you know, I'm Nigerian myself, and I have certainly encountered a lot of people who remind me of Okonkwo, who are big men, um, and are very impressed with themselves and how many yams or in current parlance, cars, uh, expensive foreign cars they've piled up and accumulated. Um, and I'm, because I'm not as much of an expert in Igbo society, I'm curious if you think that Okonkwo is both a historical and a contemporary character. And if you think uh, Achebe is bringing modern concerns back into history, um, or if you think he's just making an overall comment uh, or commentary on traditional Igbo society uh, as it may have been. Well, if you think of his whole work, there is a common thread of um, problematic, uh, over masculine, over sort of overbearing masculine figures who ultimately have to be sort of put into check in some way. And that, that's the sort of motif that plays out all the way to Ant Hills of the Savannah, where you've got this toxic uh, struggle between various guys that eventually gives way to women sort of and realizing that that's the way forward. Um, but I think that my own opinion is that um, the reason he has a conquo there as this strong man is to sort of provide an anchor. If you just had lots of people who were really accommodating and you understood other people's points of view and so on, I'm not sure the narrative would work. It's certainly in the novel sense, as a novel. Some other art forms it might work, but um, I think that he's there to hold the thing together actually, while you actually, what's most interesting is what goes on behind him. And what you, because he's a sort of naive protagonist, isn't he? So um, in the tradition of naive protagonists, he's, he, he, you're, you're supposed to see a bit over his shoulder, aren't you? And that, that's the subtlety of the novel, isn't it? Uh, so that, that's my, that's what I really, that's the effect of it, regardless of what he intended. I mean, in that interview that I uh, showed, um, he, he's saying that um, men like a conquo or the, the sort of conquerish tendencies of the Igbo are, 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 are the reason for their failure. But I think that's too crude. I, I just don't believe it even from him. <laughs> I think um, he was in a very bullish affirmative type of a mood in the mid 60s and 
And I think he was much more nuanced and balanced later on. So what do you think? I'm, yeah, I'm not really too sure. Like uh, Sarah mentioned, I was, the more I learned about Evo society, the more I was surprised at the, um, the lack of attention paid directly to the feminine. Um, but I think you're right that he does it a bit indirectly um, and it may have been an intentional choice and in that, as you put it, we're supposed to sort of see over a Concord's shoulder. Um, and then coming to know some older uh, Nigerian men that I quite like and respect um, and would view more as a role model, certainly more than a Concord, fortunately. Um, I just always thought, man, he's dense. Like you just won't get it. <laughs> and he's frustratingly dense. Um, and that just made me, it made me wonder, I go, how representative is he for that particular point in time? Um, and I'm just not entirely sure, um, not you know, having a time machine, um, but I think he might have had a much better view of it because he was in essence, just one generation removed from Woye, as you mentioned. Um, mm. Yeah, and we do have a tradition of strong men in Yoruba society as well, who were oftentimes tempered by others. Um, and they usually tended to crash and burn just like Okonkwo did. Um, and so he's a bit prophetic, I think, in the way that he, uh, he tends to, uh, to deal with them. Um, so- you may you may suggest though, that they, the, the Igbo in that period obviously had a concept equivalent to gender, yes. which isn't really a concept in, in sort of in, in, in Western thought until about the fifties. Um, not really. And they clearly did way before that date, because you could have women who would take husbands and who would be sort of, uh, I don't know if it's in law or in custom, have the privileges of a man. So, you know, the, the, the concept of, of, of um, binary sex wasn't quite as rigid. So that, that may, that, that would tend to suggest that if, if there were sort of macho guys, then there were other balancing. I mean, if, if you have too many macho guys, it, all you're going to do is be at war the entire time, <laughs> as we've seen lately. Um, yeah. Well, I had a, another question, and this was the one that uh, it, it actually got sparked from even before you started your presentation when we first talked, but um, I'm even more curious about it now after having heard from you. Uh, which is that I was introduced to Things Fall Apart as a great anti-colonial novel, um, first time that I read it. Um, and then when I went through the entire book, I thought, are you sure that's actually what's going on here? <laughs> that's not quite what I got out of it. And having read it more, I'm increasingly of exactly your point of view on it, that he's critical of colonialism, but not in the kind of simplistic uh, and absolute way that uh, is generally the case. And I'm curious too, if you have any thoughts on exactly why that's the way it's generally presented to people. Is it just because it's neat and it's easy um, and you can in essence misread it that way? Um, and I asked the question because I just finished teaching um, Moses Man of the Mountain by Zora Neale Hurston, um, which is similarly incredibly ambiguous and nuanced in the way it deals with a number of different issues, including religion. Um, but most reviewers tend to entirely miss the point. Um, and it gets misrepresented as just like, oh, a nice way to retell the story of Moses. Um, and I, I'm not entirely sure myself just yet, but I wonder if the nuance, uh, which I think is the best part of the book, uh, might be part of the reason why it's misunderstood. Um, or if you think there are other outside factors, like say political expediency or, or something else that's happening um, at the moment. I think maybe it might be because the people who are reading it who wrote their readings down tended to be Western. So for example, early reviewers uh, in the UK uh, were annoyed that he didn't come down on one side for colonialism or, or against it. And he needed to, he needed to make up his mind. And also wasn't it hypocrisy for uh, educated, you know, privileged young men like him and others, other, you know, young, educated Africans to uh, sort of moan about the uh, destruction of, um, uh, you know, traditional societies. I, I'm aware of the odd, oddness of the word tradition. I don't know what other indigenous society, let's say. Um, but um, 
so you've got the, the they they were sort of very much reading it in terms of their own their own concerns and their sort of moral concerns, and then later, the novel got caught up in the in in post colonialism, which initially um, it was quite influenced by scholars from Australia and from about the seventies, and it was very the, the, the early. Uh, sort of um, themes of that were very much about resistance writing, the concept of writing back. So you writers who especially took a, a Western text like um, Jane Eyre, say, or um, in the case of words like SOC or um, uh, Robinson Crusoe in the case of Foe, and, um, and they, they'd write back to the colonial centre and sort of set the record straight. And um, things fall apart tended to be co-opted to that agenda, and it was seen as particularly writing back to Heart of Darkness by Joseph Conrad, which I don't know if it's writing back to Heart of Darkness. It isn't a journey down a river. Um, I mean, it's not. Okay, Conrad has a really oversimplistic white supremacist racist depiction of Africans. We can all agree on that. But I'm, I think that um, figures like George Basden are much more important in, in shaping uh, Achebe's disgust and need to, to write back, if there, if there is one. And I, I think that um, I suspect that the novel just got caught up in people's agendas, and that's why it's sort of willfully read in particular terms. And you do see this with texts, that there are kind of... Um, there are a sort of dominant ways of reading for quite a while. And then someone will come along and, and say, no, 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 you can actually read this in this way. Um, so the sort of Igbo Achebe hasn't emerged until quite recently, I would say. Would, would you agree with that? Yeah, I, I think I would have to, um, because I, like I said, the way that I was introduced to it was, uh, it was anti-colonial and resisting uh, oppression and Westernization and, um, it seemed to be more of a critique of Okonkwo than anything else to me. Um, and I, uh, I'm not sure what you would make of this particular interpretation, but I, this time rereading it, I, um, I actually thought that in a certain sense, Achebe, in, at least in this part of uh, you know, his, the trilogy, um, is actually trying to decenter colonization, even though he gives a very uh, nuanced account of it and puts it in this broader context, like you mentioned, like the amalgamation of Nigeria. Um, but he seems to be, uh, in essence, talking about dynamics that were present in the society already and dangers um, that were um, that existed internally, regardless of uh, what was going on with. Um, white missionaries coming that people may or may not have ever seen before. Um, and it, it seems like he's much more focused on Okonkwo and the way he responds than he is actually on the missionaries themselves. Not that he isn't concerned about them, but he seems to be devoting a lot more time and attention to a kind of more internally focused. Um, and this may be me just uh, committing the same crime as previous uh, interpreters, um, but I know there's a, a movement within Af certain circles in African studies to um, rethink the whole pre-colonial, colonial, post-colonial post um, temporization. Um, and I actually think you might be able to see some seeds of that in this novel as well, that he takes colonialism seriously, but he doesn't necessarily put it right at the center of everything. Um, but I don't know, do you think I'm off base there? Guys, I wonder, I see Sarah up in the, the gallery, on my screen up in the gallery. I wonder if we could invite Sarah in for, uh, for the remainder. Oh, look at that, she's here. Sure, while Sarah comes in, maybe I could That's say, right, yeah. just, uh, um, hi Sarah, how are you doing? Um, I think that he, less so in things fall apart, but certainly as his writing goes on, quite interested to add colonialism more into the mix. So the guy who's just called the district commissioner in um, things fall apart comes back in Arrow of God, and we find out that he's called George Allen, and there's this entire a quote from the book from the primitive tribes of the Lower Niger. And um, it is our greatest pride that they do, albeit fit cheerfully, send us fearless and erect to lead the backward races into line and so on. And he's he's a kind of um, he's a racist evangelical. And you and, and he becomes in a way that's comic, in a way, also. And there are other characters, other Winterbottom, who's the the um, 
he's not a district officer, he's something else anyway, he's the colonial official in Arrow of God, which is kind of a similar situation to slightly late, set later. There's a direct parallelism between him and the main character, Zulu, and um, that, so colonialism is becoming more central, and they're both perverse and arrogant and, and willfully blind, and that their, their, their joint perversity leads to um, a lot of problems. So actually, well, I think he's, I wouldn't say, I think he's maybe interested in bringing that strand more into the narrative in terms of its tapestry. That, that would be my thought. I don't know if Sarah has any. I want to say, first of all, just um, thank you, both Jago and JG, for your amazing um, presentations this morning. I feel that I've learned so much and I was so enjoying your conversation. And as I'm sure you saw, nodding along enthusiastically. Um, but I, I was just um, sort of agreeing in particular with um, JG's point about the way in which scholars of Africa are sort of reapproaching questions of temporality about the sort of the, the boundaries between the pre-colonial, the colonial and the post-colonial and not only sort of messing with those boundaries a bit, but also sort of questioning, well, what do we mean exactly by these, these, these eras? Um, is it useful to divide this time into these broad categories? And I think sort of thinking beyond that, sort of readdressing the categories that scholars have used to approach African history, sort of questions of agency and questions, the, sort of a binary of resistance or collaboration and sort of really kind of unpicking all of those ideas that sort of really emerged specifically in the 1960s when scholars are beginning to really, at least scholars in the West are beginning to take African history very seriously in the wake of decolonization and are writing often in, in sympathy to decolonial movements. And I think that what we need now is to sort of go back and say, well, are these, are these categories, ideas working for us? Do they make sense? Or can we write about the past in more complicated ways? Mm. <laughs> that's very eloquent yeah I mean that that's uh, my own oh you'll be far more expert on this than me but colonialism was an always changing thing is my understanding it was initially almost entirely entrepreneurial um later it um later it became sort of more state oriented partly just in turn because of competition with other European powers then you're moving into a sort of uh, neo-colonial phase, I guess. You saw that in the Biafran War, the Brit Brit Britain's absolute determination not to lose, not to lose control. And um, we committed uh, two thirds of the ammunition uh, possessed by the British Armed Forces worldwide to helping murder however many hundred thousand people died in that conflict. Quite amazing. I mean, so, and that's after decolonization allegedly. So yeah, it's, a, um, I mean, uh, that work's going to be very, that ongoing work's going to be very interesting. I think it'll help us to write more books, but I'd say very. <laughs> well, well, if that's the case, I, I do think he may have been a bit ahead of his time in thinking about it in that way, in that, you know, his understanding of colonialism does seem to be um, much more nuanced and he takes a kind of broader view of it. Um, and I like the way you were talking about uh, you know, precursors to the amalgamation of Nigeria, even though the characters in the novel don't see that that's what's happening um, from their perspective, but it's nonetheless very much happening um, in the background. And I know there's been some work on how, you know, modernity and identity formation and all of these things that are very much part of a modern era um, happened in Nigeria long before colonialism ever started. Um, and that also some of the most seismic shifts in society also happened even before Europeans ever showed up. Um, and we don't want to forget all of that by just, you know, alighting it into that same category of the pre-colonial, because what was colonial, like you mentioned, actually starts happening before, you know, the Berlin Conference. Um, and it certainly hasn't stopped after 1960 in Nigeria today uh, by any stretch of the imagination. And I hadn't thought about the, uh, the book in that type of context before. Um, and I think I'm gonna give it a bit more thought, but I think you're right that um, as he moves on um, in Arrow of God, for sure, he starts to deal with colonialism very directly. And it is the central issue there. Um, I'm just starting to think about it again with um, things fall apart at least. It's dealt with also no longer at ease mm -hmm. in that you've got, again, this bureaucrat 
this colonial official, I think he's called Mr. Green in this case. And it's funny how the Englishman or Smith or Green. Because they're slightly designed, they're designed to be slightly pantomimic, I think, slightly pantomime figures. And um, he's an out and out racist, but nevertheless works for the for the for the nation as he sees it. Just as actually you find that George Allen, the district commissioner in Things Fall Apart, however brutal and racist and wrong, nevertheless believes in his mission, as does Winterbottom. And you've got this kind of this other religion in a way. Um, a bit is sort of going on in the background. Yeah. There's a lot of so many interesting strands. Um, yeah. That's why the, these books are so endlessly interesting to talk about because um, I, when I've sometimes worked on popular fiction, I found it much, much harder because you just don't get the richness, the rich tapestry in the same way and the ambiguity and the undecidability that, and that the, the, the texts don't keep coming alive in different ways with different perspectives. I mean, it's not that they aren't worthy of being read, but I think that's why we've always settled on these literary texts because they somehow, they keep, they keep the fire burning. <laughs> yeah. Well, I don't know if we have time for another question. Yeah. Oh. Well, I have a lot. Uh, Jacob, because you you sparked all kinds of thoughts uh, in me. I've spent a fair amount of time at the University of Ibadan and had family members who I mean, went there and studied. Yeah, and I recognize that place in the picture as well. Um, and uh, maybe I'll send you an email some other time about this fascinating connection with, um, I think, is it Marsden, the uh, colonial official? Um, I didn't realize that he had connections to um, Achebe's family. Um, and the idea that he may have been um, reacting to what he read at the UI library um, there is really fascinating to me, but I think I'd mostly in our time left like to pick up on what you just mentioned and the way that things fall apart kind of keeps the fire going. Um, when I mentioned to a friend that I was reading Things Fall Apart again, um, when we were talking about you know, the place it's played in um, educational systems, um, certainly internationally, um, but also in Africa, um, my friend quite likes the book, but said, oh, do you think we're gonna to start to see a new book that kind of takes its place or will be integrated into the curriculum? Um, and I didn't really have a good answer for him, but I, part of me does think that things fall apart as you know, one of the most masterful novels that I think I've ever read. Um, as uh, a brilliant piece of art, it feels timeless to me. Mm. It will age very, very well and will practically be perennially relevant. Um, and I'm curious what you would have to say about that as you know, the one who's probably sat and thought with this novel the most and knows about it in the context of education in Africa um, and can comment on it as a literary critic as well. Uh, sorry, are you, are you asking me what can replace it? Um, I'd say if you maybe share my opinion that it's perhaps timeless just because of the, its inherent quality, or if you think there is room for something else to start moving in and occupying some of the role that Things Fall Apart has. Well, first off, I like the point that I made in, the, in my talk, which is that it actually funded mm -hmm. the Renaissance of African literature. That's a point that isn't often understood, that it funded the African Writers Series. Um, the, the African Writers Series wouldn't have been viable without it. So it genuinely, it helped Ngugi along and it helped Enjeta along, you know, it helped also, and, and it, it, that book put loads of other books and writers, a whole range of other books and writers on the desks and bedside tables of kids around Africa, which is really incredible. If you, I mean, the writer who at the moment for me, um, has that same star quality is um, Adichie, Jimamanda Adichie. I just think she's, and there are lots of other Nigerian writers who are very interesting, but can't necessarily hold a flame to Achebe, Emma Ch but Jim Achete, for example. I, I mean, she's really interesting. I do teach her and all the rest of it, but her stuff, but um, it's not as masterful. But Adichie, boy, does she know what she's doing in Americana, for example. I'm really impressed with her. And I think, I hope she keeps that fire going because I think she's got incredible, I hope she keeps 
that those texts are genuine. That, that you can see the the um, references to Achebe, and I think she might even be his goddaughter. But she's her own writer for sure, and and is is less indebted than many others, I think. Um, do you have a view, sir? It's such a good question. I was just trying to think, you know, who would who would replace? Um, I think um, Nanda Adichie is, yeah, that, that um, I, yeah, I mean, that Adichie is is, is, um, is a very, yeah, is one person. Um, I'm just, um, I, I think that the question, that what I was thinking was, I, w I wonder if South African children are still reading things that fall, fall apart in high school. I'm not actually sure if that's the case. Um, and um, I'd be interested to know what they are reading. Um, and I, I, I suppose the, the, uh, that sort of leads to my, my sort of more important point is that I wonder to what degree children in, across the continent are reading local authors, that, that instead of sort of reading across the continent, children are reading what's available locally. And so that there's that, I mean, he's writing in this particular Pan-African moment where there is this desire that people read across borders and sort of develop a sense of a kind of a post-colonial literary canon. Um, and I wonder that, you know, in the past 20 or 30 years, whether we've sort of retreated into the boundaries of the nation state and local publishing industries, and if we've sort of become a little more parochial in our reading. Um, but I, I mean, I speculate, I don't know if I'm, I'm right or not. And I, I mean, I mentioned last night in my um, conversation with Tope that um, uh, that we're also telling a very Anglophone story. Um, I'd be very curious to know what's happening sort of in a Francophone sort of situation or sort of Lucifer writers and if there's a similar um, sort of kind of politics around it, sort of certain kinds of novels. I mean, I, I have a pantheon of uh, Francophone novels that I love and which I teach, like Mariam Abba's Un Si Long Letra, which I love. Um, um, but um, I, I don't, I'd love to know more about the, the politics there of what gets taught and what gets read. Sorry, that's not a very thoughtful answer, but that's just sort of what's going on in my head at the moment. Mm. Thank you for that. And that expression of curiosity and desire to learn more about all of this, I think might be the perfect place for us to stop it. Um, as open and perhaps unsatisfying as that might be. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, Deji, thank you for your talk this afternoon. Jago, this, this morning and your participation just now. Uh, we appreciate it so much. Just so, such, such richness here. Uh, so thank you. And I think I'm gonna welcome Megan back into the scene.